Good morning, good afternoon, depending where you're joining us from. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar today. My name is John Baker. I'm with MBS Solutions. I am a ZOS uh, performance guy. Joining me is my friend and colleague, uh, Claire Cates. Claire is a distinguished developer with the SAS Institute. She's been with SAS for over 32 years. She specializes in performance and management. Certainly forgotten more about that than most of us will ever need to know. We're going to tag team a little bit today on the topic uh, title here, Spinning Your Wheels, CPU Time Versus Instructions, talking about processor cache. So whether you're uh, mainframe folks or distributed platform, everybody's got processors, everybody's got processor cache. It should be something of interest to you. We'll also have lots of time at the end for your questions, so hopefully you'll stick around. We'll be happy to uh, take time for that. So moving on, short agenda today. First of all, the question why, you know, why even talk about this? Why is my application system so slow comparing memory versus CPU? Fundamentals of a memory cache, what are the different layouts across uh, platforms? And finally, I want to talk a little bit about what can we do about it? It's, uh, there are a vast number of metrics available today on different systems about how to measure uh, the various statistics from your processor cache, but really what practical actions can you take to improve that? And then, of course, again, time at the end for QA. So here's some perspective. Uh, I was around for these. I'm not sure how many of you watching get a chuckle out of this. doesn't seem all that long ago, actually. But compared uh, what we might call memory density in this case, if you look at the old 3380 system, what I've got is, is 20 gigabytes versus storage there. Now, you know, even on the picture on the right is even a little bit dated by today's standards. Micro SD cards of 32 gig, it's certainly very easy to have 100 gig or more on a simple card weighing nothing and costing next to nothing as well. Uh, so obviously there's been a big change in, in the density of memory. That is the amount of data that we can store uh, within a, a physical amount of space. So why should I care about that? If memory is, is cheap, it's plentiful, uh, you know, thinking about the, the latest IBM Z13, you can have up to 10 terabytes of random access memory, what we traditionally call RAM, electronic memory. CPUs are obviously fast and, and continue to do so, 5 billion cycles per second, I mean, staggering number. And of course, when we measure things, uh, we, we're generally concerned about CPU time. What CPU is our applications using and what can we do to improve that time, uh, delay time to access the CPU? Well, here's one of the reasons you might care. Uh, comparing the, a couple of slides ago, the density of memory from days gone by to today, certainly memory is more plentiful. You can get a lot of it in a smaller space, but what about the performance? We're talking about the actual time to access memory for the processor. When you compare the great increases uh, in processor speed and how much faster they've com become compared to the speed of the memory, and that is you know, how long does it take to actually access the data in that memory. Whether I've got a kilobyte or a terabyte of memory, certainly I can have more of it, but if it's taking me a long time to access that, and at the same time the CPU is getting faster and faster, well, you, you end up with your CPU waiting, uh, spending a lot of time waiting, and that's not really productive. We'll talk more about that in detail, but start thinking about wait time, not in terms of absolute seconds, but say in terms of clock cycles and compare that to the, the number of clock cycles that a CPU can do compared to the number of cycles that are wasted waiting to access memory. So here's another perspective. Okay, so I've got my level one, level two, level three, depending on your architecture, maybe a level four in main memory. Uh, this is the processor cache that we're talking about. Um, and this gives you some perspective, of course, a little bit uh, funny, but if you think about it, where you need to go to get your next instruction uh, or the data for that instruction or both uh, can have a large impact on how long it takes to get your work done, even though you might have a very fast processor. So in this simple example here, uh, kind of comparing to the, the 
various levels of cash on the left. If your next instruction is very close, happens to be in your, your level one cache, that's very much like being right beside uh, where you are at the bottom of the screen. It's not going to take very long to fetch that instruction. However, if it's all the way across the field there, all the way across the parking lot, uh, even though we are moving at machine speed, again, a large number of processor cycles can be wasted waiting to go fetch that. So kind of think about it in that way. Another perspective, of course, and, and this hasn't changed over the years, and the, the old joke is, well, if a, if a 2 gigahertz processor is waiting for an instruction to be fetched and a 5 gigahertz processor is waiting for an instruction to be fetched, which processor waits faster? Of course, all CPUs wait at the same speed. But another way to look at that is you could say that the 5 gigahertz processor, the faster processor, is actually more wasteful because the faster processor is able to do more clock cycles in the same amount of time. So that's more potential work that's wasted with a faster processor than with a slower processor if you're waiting to fetch an instruction. Now also think about this perspective. So you're in a cab. This is just like your, your application has been dispatched. So you've been dispatched onto the processor, so you're running. You're accumulating CPU time, if you will, just as if as soon as you jump in the cab, the meter starts running. But if you're, again, waiting for instructions or data to be fetched at a, out of processor cache or main memory, that meter's still running. That CPU time is still accumulating, even though you're not actually doing productive work. Now, certainly, there's, these are very small numbers when you talk about the speed of the machine, but again, if you don't think about it in seconds, but think about it in lost productive work, number of cycles that are being wasted waiting for the data to be fetched. Now, if you look at this in the IBM uh, mainframe kind of schema, we can see we've had great gains over the years. You see the big jump in the middle of the screen there. That was when the Z10 machine came along. 50% increase, uh, then 33%, 26 and finally with the C13, only a 12% increase. The point here is, and this is a little bit of a side topic, but you, you hear all this talk about Moore's Law potentially uh, slowing down, coming to an end. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not qualified to make that declaration, but there, there are certainly signs that the rate of increase is decreasing. That is to say that we can no longer just rely on getting a faster and faster processor all the time. Uh, I think the other areas of the system are becoming more and more important, and in particular, processor cache, as we're talking about today. Uh, even though the machine is getting, the CPUs rather are getting faster, the processor caches are not. So consider this as well. Now, I'm going to pass the ball over to Claire, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the memory cache terms. Okay, my name is Claire, and uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about memory cache. First off, as John said, you know, the CPU is getting faster and faster, or has been, and the discrepancy between accessing memory and CPU is, has grown. So what did hardware vendors decide to do? Well, yes, is there fast memory? Yes, there is, but it's extremely expensive. And so what the hardware vendors decided to do was start putting caches that use this faster memory close to the CPU and try to put data in the cache that would be used uh, often. So it's the, a cache, a memory cache, is a section of the memory that is closer to the CPU. And it's supposed to store frequently used memory. But the two main design assumptions for the cache that hardware vendors put in was that data that is accessed once will more than likely be accessed again. So if you're, and it goes from instructions to data. When you're doing you know, heavy duty analysis on data, you typically use the same data again and again. And the second assumption is that memory that is accessed once, or you typically tend to access the memory in a sequential order. And as long as it's accessed in a sequential order, you will get better performance. So the biggest reason that hardware vendors put in memory caches was for performance. 
now. Do memory caches happen on all machines? Yes. It goes everywhere from the PC through distributed level to down to the Windows machines. Okay. There are two main types of memory caches. The first one is the instruction cache. And this is used for the execution of code because the code is actually stored and has to be brought into memory to execute. So again, you talk about sequential. Most of your programs are sequential. But then you'll have loops. And then the loop might, you'll want to keep the data for the instruction in the loop in the cache because it will be used often. Then you have the data cache. And this is the cache where all your memory that you allocate, you bring into the system that your, your CPU is going to act on will store. Now within the hardware vendor, what they did was actually make multiple levels of caches, where the level one cache is smaller and it's closest to the CPU, but it's the fastest. The next level is the level two cache. And if the data is not in the level one cache, it might be in the level two cache. It's slower than the level one cache, but it's a lot bigger. Now on most multi-core systems, you have an L3 cache. And again, it's bigger, but it's slower. And on some of the mainframe systems, there's even L4 caches. Next, next slide. Okay. The biggest thing is you need to get into the memory cache terms. Because when you start analyzing your system and your application as to what's going wrong, you'll start hearing all these terms. And so what I want to do is get into what some of these memory terms are that you might hear when you're doing analysis. The first term is latency. And this is the time, the delay it takes to access the memory. So if you go back to John's picture with the parking lot, it's the time to go all the way to the end of the parking lot and back that the person is just, or the processor is just sitting there waiting for. It can't get any real work done. Yes. Other um, processes on the system might be able to do something, but this, this core is waiting, trying to get something done. It is usually measured in clock cycles to, to actually get the data returned back so that the CPU can actually work on it. If you have a lot of latency, the program's going to run slower. Your system's going to run slower. The other main issue is bandwidth. You've got to take the the memory from main memory and bring it into the CPU, and it's going to go through a bus. If you've got a lot of different cores trying to bring memory from main memory into the CPU, you're going to actually saturate that bus. And if you saturate it, then you're going to have more latency because only so much can go through. So you get into a system or a, a um, you get into, basically you get to where you have to wait to even get through the bus. Now, a cache, if you actually want a piece of memory, say you're just looking for an 8-byte pointer that you've got in memory and you want to read it in. How does a system do this? Well, it does it into a cache line. You won't get just the 8 bytes. You will get a cat, what they call a cache line. On the distributed systems where I come from, this is typically 64 bytes long. On COS, some of the times it's 256 bytes. So even though I'm wanting just 8 bytes, I'm going to get 64 bytes in. Because this is one of the design assumptions, memory that's used, the memory near it is more than likely going to be used. Plus, the caches can be stored and bring in larger chunks of memory um, and not have, so when you're looking, or when the CPU is looking to see if the memory is in the cache, it doesn't have to do as much searches. It just knows that it's within this 64 byte or 256 byte block. So you need to know what a cache, the cache line is. Now, if the CPU is looking for memory, it'll first look to see if the memory or the cache line is in the L1 cache. If it is, it's called a cache hit. If it's not, it's called a cache miss. And you will see these terms a lot when you're actually looking to try to find out why your cache is causing the memory performance problem. Now, if it's not in the L1 cache, it will then look into the L2, the L3, and then go to main memory. Now, you've got a dirty cache line, and, or you've got a cache line, and you start writing data to the cache line. If you actually write data to the cache line, you know, you change the value, you increment a um, counter or something, this 
value eventually has to get written back to main memory. Until it is mapped back into main memory, this cache line is dirty, which means the main memory and the cache or the real value do not match. The system will actually decide when to do the write back, and this is the write back policy. Most of the time, your system, your CPU is going to be stalling for other things, and the processor can write the data back. You know, so if you're doing an I.O., you're waiting on an I.O., the processor might go and do some write-backs and put the, main, put the dirty cache lines back into main memory. The real problem comes in when you have multiple uh, processes or threads running on a system. And these threads actually share cache lines because then you get into the term of cache coherence where, say, you've got a block of memory that multiple threads are actually sharing, if, they, if one thread actually puts a write and updates the data, it becomes a dirty cache line. It not only becomes dirty for that CPU, but it becomes you know, unclean for the other ones. Go on to the next slide. It's the best. It's got a picture. So in this case, you can see the, you've got four CPUs, and the very first one actually changes the cache line, but it's dirty in the other ones. So when the other CPUs need to access that memory, it's got to wait until this cache is actually propagated up and back down. So it is a potential where this could be actually a problem because you're waiting, you've got the latency to wait for your cache, even though it's your memory, even though it's in the cache, it's not valid, so it has to be updated. The next terms we have are, that you will hear, are evicted. And what happens is, I mean, you've got your level one cache, and on most of the systems that I work on, it's about 32K. It's going to fill up, and it's going to fill up quickly. So when it fills up, something's got to be evicted, and it's going to be kicked out of the cache. And the new piece of memory or the new cache line will be put in. Most of the time, the replacement policy, what is going to be evicted, is the least recently used, and that's the most common one. The next terms we have are memory on all our systems is now virtualized. Main memory is brought in in large blocks, and these are called page sizes. Typically, at least on my system, they're around 4K. The pages, you will then have a page table, and the page table will be the translation to take the virtual address to the physical address so that it can find it. These, this place and this mapping is another area that you can have memory performance problems. When they do the mapping, it gets into the translation look side buffer. So it is basically the TLB, which you will hear if you look at um, statistic or the processor um, counters and stuff, you might see the TLB misses. What the TLB is, is a basically a cache to the page table. So pages that are used often, the virtual the mapping will actually be stored in the TLB. So if you see a lot of TLB misses, then you've got a lot of random access going on in your program, and the pages aren't in memory or you know, need to be, the relocation needs to be recalculated again. And then the final term I have is prefetching. And a lot of the new processors will actually have prefetching that you can turn on and off. And what prefetching will do is assume that either instructions or data, they guess that this data or instruction set might be used, and they'll actually prefetch it into the cache. And when prefetching works, it works great because you're going along, you're going through an array, and it's bringing the cache lines in before you need it. So when the CPU actually needs it, the data is actually in the cache line. The problem comes about is when it guesses wrong. So if the CPU thinks that the next data that's going to be accessed is this cache line and it's never used, what you've done is evicted good data possibly out of the cache. And other than that, you've also sent that memory through the pipeline. And so you could have bandwidth issues. So looking at prefetching is another way that you might uh, have problems. Now I'm going to turn it back over to John, and he's going to get into a little bit more of the mainframe. Thanks, Claire. 
So if you look at the, the Z13 high-level design, this is in a lot of the IBM manuals, basically we've got a lot of real estate here if you're talking about uh, memory. This basic design point goes back to actually the Z10, uh, these multiple levels. Uh, when we, we had books, now we call them drawers, uh, and what you have in this particular picture is you've got two nodes uh, at the bottom of the screen to the, the red areas marked PU1 through PU8. Those are the actual physical cores. The level one and level two uh, caches are physically on the core, and you can see the sizes listed there. Each uh, eight cores share a level three cache. Um, and each node has its own level four cache. Now it's possible as well to access memory from a remote level four, which would be in the same drawer, uh, but not in the same node, or out into main memory. Uh, and when you hear about the, uh, you know, the advertised uh, 10 terabytes uh, of main memory you can have, what that's referring to, the main memory at the top, if you've got uh, two and a half terabytes in each of a maximum of four drawers, that's where your 10 terabytes comes from. Now Claire talked a little bit about uh, how data gets in and out and, and the cache line sizes. In the Z13, uh, they, are, uh, they are larger, 256 bytes, uh, cache lines. And as she mentioned, you, you're bringing in this entire line uh, and the method used uh, mentioned LRU as well. As data is evicted when we need more space, least recently used is, is common, it's done with, it's done with disk, it's done with uh, processor memory, it simply, essentially says the data that has uh, not been accessed uh, recently is thrown out in order to make space for new data. And again, talking about latency, while you can look at that in time, again, we're talking here about clock cycles, and here's some estimated numbers you know, one to ten or tens or perhaps even hundreds of clock cycles can be wasted if the data that you need is far out. You, you may also hear, you know, when you talk about the Z13, uh, the nest, you hear that term, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but this is what we're referring to. The nest uh, in this diagram is from your level three and higher, level three, level four in main memory, specifically referring to the, the processor caches that are not physically on the cores. So when you're talking about the term of relative nest intensity, you're talking about how deep and how often am I going into those levels of memory. And this is where we get the, the relative measurements. Um, the TLBs, as Claire talked about as well, if you're familiar with the SMF side of the world, this is what's in your uh, CPU uh, measurement facility, the type 113 SMF records contain all these statistics. I think I just had a page fault. I'm going to pass back to Claire. Here we go. So he was just explaining some of the stuff on the Z-series side. This is the data from an older processor that we use, the Sandy Bridge, and so some of the latencies for accessing memory. So if you look, if you're ordering, looking at the data sequential or in-page random or full random, it only takes four clock cycles to get the data out of the L1 cache. To get it out of the L2 cache, it's 11 clock cycles. You start seeing a difference when it's in the L3 cache. You can see that the sequential is much faster than the full random, getting it out of the L3 cache. Because when you're getting it out of the L3 cache for the full random, you've probably got a TLB miss, and it's got to recalculate that uh, mapping of the virtual to physical address. But look how much more it goes when it goes to main memory. When John sends it to the next slide, you'll actually see the graph of what happens. Next slide. Okay. So from here, you can see that if the data is in the register, it takes zero clock cycles. If it's in the L1 cache on a 3 gigahertz processor, it can execute three instructions per cycle. So if it takes four clock cycles, it would, we could actually have executed 12 instructions that our CPU is just sitting there waiting for. If we have to go to the L2 cache, we could have executed 44 instructions. And then if we actually are going to main memory, for 6 nanoseconds, it could have actually executed 54 instructions. But if we have to go to main memory 
and it has a TLB mess and bring in the new page in, we could be at waiting for 600 instructions. So you can make your application faster, you can make your system faster, but if 600% of the time if your CPU is just sitting there waiting, you know, you're not going to be making it any faster. You've got to start worrying about you know, making sure that the data is in the cache that you need. Now, even making it more complicated is the new chip designs. We've had Yuma around for years, but now we're going more to NUMA. And I'll get into a little bit um, more of this. This, we've got Yuma, which is the uniform memory access. All the older chips had memory that was equidistant from the processors that they're working on. So if one processor wanted to get into main memory, it would go through the bus, it would access common main memory. The good thing about this was timings were consistent. You could run your same application, your same system set up again and again, and your timings would be consistent. The problem is, because the Moore's Law and the processors aren't necessarily getting faster, the hardware vendors are putting more and more and more cores on a chip. So what's happening is this memory bus is getting saturated, so your bandwidth is just getting all blown away. And so they decided to come up with NUMA. And NUMA is, oh, John was talking about uh, the boxing, and this, so it's the same concept, even though I'm from the distributed side, they have the same concept on the ZOS series. With NUMA, you've got memory that is local to the same node that your CPUs are running on, and there's memory on remote nodes. The problem is, is that the memory, if you access um, from node 0, can access the main memory on node 1, but it not only has to go through the bus, but it's got to go through this local interconnect to get to the other nodes, and this can be much slower. They started using these NUMA designs because the bandwidth was getting so slow that if they put the local memory or memory on each node, that the um, hardware wouldn't be beating up against the bandwidth so much. Um, the accessing the data on your local node is much, much faster than accessing it on the remote node. Next, Next slide. Okay, that previous slide only had two nodes. In this case, you've got four nodes. If you access memory, if you're running on node 0, and you actually access the main memory on node 0, it is much faster than accessing the main memory on node 1. But it could even be more, accessing it on node 1 could actually be even faster than accessing it on node 2. Because depending how the chips are set up, they can, you can actually go through multiple interconnects to try to get to the data. Also, many popular machines now have up to eight nodes and 10 cords per node, so you can get through a lot of interconnects. And the big thing about NUMA, though, is because it's non-uniform memory access, because the timing is different depending on where the memory is located, you can have inconsistent timings. We've actually seen it here when the code wasn't NUMA aware, where um, the timings would vary as much as 40%. You run it once, and it's this amount of time to run the application. You run it again, it's 40% faster, 40% slower. You start scratching your head, and what it really, uh, what's actually occurring is that the mem where the memory is located is what's causing the problems. Okay. So as I said before, local memory doesn't have to go through the interconnect, and therefore it's faster. Uh, local memory, ha therefore, local memory has less uh, latency. The closer the memory is to the core, the better for performance. This happens for caches. This happens for NUMA. NUMA is available on all varieties of Unix, and as I've seen now on the Z series. The main way the memory gets placed is for the OS to place it. I'll get a little bit more into that on the next slide. But uh, this is what caused the varying run times. And finally, one thing that I actually noticed, um, or we've actually seen, is IO caches can actually affect the NUMA memory. What we had once was that when our system initialized, it was all running on one core, 
one thread. And during this initialization process, we brought, brought in a lot of the images, you know, some of the files that we opened, all our shared libraries or DLLs that we brought in. And all these images got put into an IO cache, which happened to be on a local node. Then when we actually started running the system, our system had lower memory or you know, lower free memory on that node. And so it started doing remote accesses. So you also need to make sure that as you're bringing in your IO, uh, that it, it is also spread out across the different nodes. So how is memory placed? At least on the distributed uh, side, memory is placed when a page, the memory in the page is first touched. So if a page is allocated, it is not actually placed on a NUMA node at that time. It's when the hardware fault is generated, the page fault, or when the physical page needs to be allocated. And at that time, at least the default policy is that the page will be put owned to the same node that the CPU is currently working on. This works most of the time, but it, say you've got a parent thread that is allocating storage for each of the children threads that are going to be spawned off to actually use. If the parent thread is the one that's actually touching the memory, then it's not on the same node possibly as the local thread or as the child thread that's going to be using it. So an application actually needs to know about NUMA and placing the memory that it can to the node that actually is going to have the thread running. And at least on the distributed side, there is a library that can be called that you can add into the application that will actually allow the application to place the memory. But that doesn't mean that you always want the memory on the node that it is running on. Because if you've got, say, a huge large block of memory that all the different threads are actually allocate or accessing, if it's all on one node, then all the other threads are going to have to be pounding on the interconnect going into that node. So sometimes when you've got a large block of shared memory, you actually might want to interleave the memory across all the nodes so that all the interconnects are going to be hit and that all the threads that are accessing it will be able to access the memory locally. Okay. So next we're getting back to John and he is going to talk some about system performance. Thanks Claire. Another page fault. Okay. So just switching back to the, the Z side again a little bit here. When we started researching this I went back and read the LSPR doc. Um, yeah, it's worth doing for those of you that haven't in a while. It's it's not nearly as, as scary as going back and reading, say, the POP manual, the dreaded principles of operations. It's actually not that difficult. And there's a lot of really good information in there. At a high level, what we're talking about here from the LSPR is that there are three major factors that affect our workload performance, our instruction path length, our instruction complexity, and our memory hierarchy. And again, this is where we'll get into that term the nest. So what's path length? Well this is really just the accumulated instructions that your application needs, your, your program. So as well as through the operating system and subsystems and so on. And There's really two parts to this. Uh, basically your application path length. What your application needs to do. And of course unless you change your own code there's not a lot you can do about that. Uh, and the machine path length. And you can have uh, some impact on this. The, the machine path length, even when running the same application, can vary depending on, for example here, the number of concurrent tasks. Because this is now, you have competing tasks for the processors. If you think about the, the subjects that, that Claire and I have talked about so far, you think about the competition for those processor caches, you think about when the when uh, I don't have any more room and I need to flush some data out and bring in new cache lines, the more concurrent tasks you have, the greater the probability for that type of swapping to take place. And what I end up doing is kind of providing small amounts of service to many tasks, but no one task is actually getting completed. So if you think about that, whether it's a transaction or a batch job, um, the idea is that you want to get the work done. There's little value in having something that's half done. 
this can also be affected with the number of logical processors. And again, there's a, there's a concurrency thing to think about there. Uh, we already know about, uh, likely most of you do know about what we call the MP effect. This is uh, when you have multiple physical processors competing with each other. There's some integrity exposures and shared memory. So the, the effect of that is that as you have more physical processors, the actual capability of each individual engine or core is reduced. Uh, this can be a similar type of effect with number of logical processors competing for physical cores. Instruction complexity, well, this is, again, back to your, your actual application, your program. And what instructions are you doing? Do you, do you have a lot of loops or go-to statements? You know, is, is, the, uh, is the code fairly sequential in nature? This can really only be addressed by looking at the application code itself. So if you're talking about this on the system side, well, you got to go make friends with your developer, essentially. Uh, outside of that, this is going to be highly dependent on the actual processor speed, um, the design, uh, and features kind of listed here. Not a whole lot you can do in that area if you can't actually change the code. But finally, however, the memory hierarchy, and this is what we're focused on today. And this refers to the caches, the data buses, the memory that stage these instructions and data to and from the CPUs. Uh, we've talked about some caches are dedicated. These are your level one and level two that will be local to a core. Others are shared. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in the Z architecture, the shared caches and memory are referred to as the nest. And that is this blue highlighted area here. So getting back to that diagram we showed earlier, this is your, your basic Z13 design with your cores at the bottom various levels of shared cache at the top, and all of those levels of shared cache, uh, again, in the blue area, that is what we refer to as the nest. And when IBM uses the term relative nest intensity, again, this is a specific measurement, and you've got the formula at the bottom of the screen. This is right on the LSPR page. It is different for each machine um, because, uh, basically because of the, the size of the different uh, levels of cache and the design slight design differences in where they may be located, but you can kind of see what they're doing. If you follow the, uh, the formula at the bottom, what you have is a multiplier times uh, level three times level four LP, that's the local, that means I'm on the same uh, node, or the level three RP, that'll be remote, that means I've had to go across to another node. So you've got a higher multiplier there. And then, of course, the highest if I have to go out to main memory. So what this is measuring, the reason they call it intensity, is a, a smaller number of fetches that go deeper into the nest. And by deeper, that would be level four and main memory, for example, uh, can be just as impactful as a large number of references to, say, the local level three and essentially you're going to come up with a number, a uh, relatively small number, but what you want to do is compare those. Now, while this is also used to kind of profile your workload, there are some things that you can do uh, about it, and that's really what I want to talk about. So again, this is right from the LSPR, and the question that I've added is what can we control here? Uh, what these are are tendencies. So when you have uh, an application type of batch versus transactional, that tends to have a lower relative nest intensity or RNI than, say, transactional workloads. If you have workloads that have a lower I.O. rate, they will tend to have a lower relative nest intensity. Now, let's just pause for a second. Is there anything I can do about that? Do I have to just accept these and say, well, my workload has X profile? Well, not necessarily in all cases. Uh, take the I.O. rate. Can you affect your I.O. rate? Yes. You can use good old-fashioned buffers, for example. Uh, you can use the new compression cards. I'm hearing very, very good things about that. Compressing your data will reduce uh, the number of I.O.s to storage. You can lower your I.O. rate, you have the ability to actually lower your R&I to a degree. Consider the application mix 
single versus many. Essentially, if you look at your LPAR and look at the, the profile of the applications that run on your LPAR, do you have dozens or hundreds of applications on the same LPAR? Now, maybe you have the capacity to manage that and you, you add capacity in engines over the years, but do you need that many in one place? This is, again, think about that competition aspect of things. If you can reduce the number of diverse applications that are accessing the hardware, you can improve your R&I. This is kind of logical if you think about it. Again, with the cash lines uh, rules, when you think about the design point that data is expected to be referenced again, and data that is close to other data in cache, we refer to this as the locality, that is also expected to be referenced. If you're running a small number of applications or very similar applications that access the same data, you have a greater probability of reusing a lot of that cache, and that's where your benefit can come from. Conversely, if you have many different applications, you're going to be swapping data out more frequently. The middle areas, uh, CPU uses dispatch rate. There's not a lot that can be done in this area, although I would point out, you know, think about your utilization. Uh, think about your, uh, in the Z world specifically, obviously we're talking about here, your, your hyper-dispatch allocation. Take a look at the, that data and see are you getting vertical highs uh, versus vertical mediums or vertical lows. Uh, you, you want to minimize the number of vertical lows in particular. What this refers to is associating a logical processor on your LPAR with a physical processor in the machine. It's obviously the, the physical cache that's on the core that we're trying to optimize here. Um, and PRISM will always try to dispatch the same logical processor on your LPAR to the same physical core, improving the probability of you uh, finding your data in cache again. But if you're talking about vertical lows and you a lot of sharing, you're going to reduce that probability significantly. So you know, think about that. LPAR configuration, uh, what they're referring to here, simple versus complex, how many LPARs do you have? Uh, in theory, I, I think the, the latest update, you can have 85 LPARs on a Z13. Let's think about that for a minute. Uh, it's a staggering uh, capacity numbers if you want to add them all up. 140 or so logical processors in theory on each of 85 LPARs uh, times 140 physical processors on the machine, you can have a, again, a staggering amount of virtual capacity there. But how well is that really going to run? If you think about that, um, reduce them if you can. If you don't need too many, if you have a lot of duplicate LPARs that have the same function, particularly you have a large number of LPARs with very small weights, you know, single digit weights, you're probably better off combining those. If you've got two or three at two or three percent, maybe one LPAR with a 10 percent weight is going to perform much better. Also, getting back to that point about hyper-dispatch, you know, a higher probability of getting a vertical high uh, and more efficient use of the hardware. Now, speaking of some of the stats, uh, this is just a couple of numbers from the CPU measurement facility, uh, the SMF113 records. There are a lot more variables that are available, but this is some of the high-level ones that I'd suggest you look at. Now, what I've got in these uh, two tables, this is from the same machine. Uh, the far left LPS is the number of logical processors. Uh, there's two different LPARs here, so I've got an LPAR on the top with 16, LPAR at the bottom with two. Next column, CPI, this is cycles per instruction. This is uh, a very fundamental metric that you want to think about when you're looking about uh, when you're looking at this data. How many cycles, on average, over the interval, and these are interval records. Uh, does it take to execute each instruction? You see in the bottom of example where it's basically one, that's about as efficient as you can get. That says, I'm doing an instruction for every clock cycle. In theory, five gigahertz processor, five billion cycles per second, I'm executing five billion instructions per second. That's very, very efficient. Um, I've got a factor of eight on the top, so it's taking me seven or eight cycles to execute a single 
instruction in the top example. And just think about translating that to uh, management terms. You think about 5 billion instructions per second. What does that term remind us of from uh, days gone by? 5 billion instructions per second is 5,000 MIPS. If you can improve this metric and you can measure it, you can actually demonstrate to your management that you've improved the MIPS capacity on the same hardware. Just thinking how cool that would be. So the rest of the metrics here, just quickly, level one miss percentage, uh, always checks level one first. If it's not there, then I've got uh, level, uh, level two hit percentage, level three, level four local, that's the LP, level four remote, that's going to the other node. Uh, percentage hits in memory and then the calculated RNI from that and you, you can see the differences you know particularly you look at the top you see that second one down the much higher RNI 2.73 you can immediately see why uh, it's not just a dramatic difference in the level one uh, miss percentage but the uh, 12 13 percent uh, going to main memory that's uh, significant The last thing I just want to touch on, they refer to, IBM refers to as software configuration tuning. Uh, and the point here being that if you have done extensive software configuration tuning versus limited, you have the ability to lower uh, your RNI. Um, now rather than try and uh, translate that into my own words, this is directly from the LSPR. In a nutshell, what software configuration tuning is in English? Run less stuff. That's what it is. They're referring to, as it says here, the number of address spaces, kicks AORs, batch initiators, concurrency. We've kind of been uh, talking about that point in various levels, and that's what we're talking about here. The number of concurrent address spaces required to uh, run your application, service your workload, uh, any way you want to look at that. If you can reduce the number of concurrent address spaces, you have the ability to reduce your relative nest intensity. Um, it's futile and ineffective to put a whole bunch of uh, concurrent address spaces into a system running at 100% busy, all of them constantly swapping out, inching along, getting a little bit of work done. None of them are actually getting completed. Yes, you certainly have a vast amount of memory available in the machine, but what you want to think about is how much are you stressing these processor caches. Now, never one to just automatically believe uh, IBM or anyone else, we thought we might measure this. So we ran a benchmark on our own machine and simple high level uh, process. What we did here was submitted a thousand jobs. This is an isolated machine, isolated LPAR, nothing else running. A um, thousand jobs, steady state of submission through a scheduler, all running in the same service class. Mixed profile of batch jobs, some CPU bound, I/O bound, and so on. First, let them run with WLM initiators and just let them go as far as they wanted. Uh, and of course, what WLM will do, it continues to start more initiators. It sees the queue time building. It doesn't like that. It factors queue time in the velocity calculation. Wants to address that uh, velocity uh, delay, so it starts more. But what you end up with at the cross the top of the screen here is you end up with 300 concurrent address spaces and a system at 100% busy and they're not moving very fast uh, and it takes at the end there uh, the pink line far right you can see it takes just about 10 hours to finish the run then we ran it again and we built some automation to check the state of the system before actually starting more initiators. In a nutshell, what we're looking at is what is the current utilization of the LPAR in the machine? What is the performance index of the service class that's running the work and going to be running the new work since they're all in one service class? And what's the CPU delay of that service class? And is it excessive? What we're trying to do is optimize the load. Think about putting cars onto the highway, but just enough so everybody's still going the speed limit not so much so you start getting into gridlock. And what we found, you know, the blue line at the bottom was the result of that, is that uh, this automation only ran about 25 concurrent initiators, got all the work done about an hour sooner. But more impressive than that is the green line. This is a measurement of jobs that were completed. 
at the same point in time, jobs ahead uh, using the, the run from the bottom, the 25 versus 300 concurrent, uh, halfway through, I've completed 100 jobs more. So really what we're talking about here, what's the point? Why would I have 300 concurrent address spaces when I could have 25 and finish the work faster? I think essentially this proves the point that IBM is talking about. It's really not useful to just flood the system with work. And I think I just had another page fault. I'm going to pass it back to Claire. <laughs> well, as John said, you can tune stuff on the system to actually don't run as many processes so that it will run faster. But oftentimes, it is the actual application that is causing the problem. And the application may not be NUMA aware or even cache aware. And it's written so that it doesn't follow the basic two you know, constructs of a cache. Now, I do have a paper that I've presented at, at CMG, both one on NUMA and one on caches, that go into much more detail on both NUMA and memory caches, and especially on the software side, on the application side. Um, but this presentation is more just a high-level overview. So the two design assumptions, again, for a cache is that data that's accessed once will more than likely be accessed again, and that when memory is accessed, memory near that location will be accessed. So the first problem from an application side is fetch utilization. You're bringing memory into your cache. You're bringing a cache line in. 64 bytes on my side, 256 bytes on John's side. If you're only using 8 bytes of that 64-byte cache, you're wasting the rest of the memory in that, that cache. It's taking up memory in the cache. It's having to go through the, ca the um, bus, so uh, interfering with the bandwidth. So the first thing as an application writer is, is to make sure that the data that's in the cache that's brought in, as much of it, it can be used as possible. You want a high percentage fetch utilization. If it's brought in, hopefully it's used. Things that you can do for this is specific, a lot, is like if you've got a lot of structures that you're bringing in, is make sure that the data that is read and used often is put together in the structure. Make sure that the data that is written often is put close together in the structure. Make sure that you align the data within the structure. Make sure that you use the right data sizes. So if you need an int, don't use a law. If you need a character of 20 bytes, don't go, oh, well, I'll just add it out to 100. It's going to be pulling in the data that actually satisfies that cache line. And this is data that might not be used. The next is data access problem. You've got data that you're bringing in, but you're accessing it so much or that it is so large that you're bringing in that it's getting evicted out of the cache before it can be used again. So say you have a large matrix. If you did it in row order and the rows are very big, you could blow through that 32K L1 cache in no time. Even though you're going to come back and use the um, memory or the same you know, I items again, you've already blown them out of the cache. And the next time that you come back around, you're going to have to reload that cache line. So the best thing there is to start breaking it up into smaller chunks. Sometimes the smaller chunks, if like the number of rows is not that large, if it's only 10, or the number of columns is only 10, then you can just rework your inner and outer loop so that it just makes sure that the data stays in the cache and is used as often as possible before evicting it and moving on to the next cache. So breaking it up into smaller places or rearranging it or even breaking you know, making multiple levels of inner loops so that it, again, just makes it into smaller chunks and then recombining it at the end will help. I've already talked a little bit about the cache coherency, but the biggest thing there is make sure that you reduce the number of writes back, especially the writes that have to go back to um, main memory. So in your structures, in your data, try to put all the writes data together. So if, you're at, if you've got a structure and you're changing five variables in that structure, make sure those five variables are close together. Because if that cache line has to be written back, 
let's put it all in one cache line so that it's just one cache line that's written back. If you've got a large structure and you split it up between it, you might have five different cache lines in the uh, L1 cache that eventually have to get written back to main memory or shared with the other um, cores or threads that are running out there. And the final one is fault sharing. And this is one that is um, a real bear to debug and find. And what fault sharing is, is that you've got two or more threads that are actually using the same cache line, but they're not sharing the data. And the best way to describe this is I allocate an array of integers that are just counters. And I make, I've got 10 threads running, and I allocate this array of 10 integers. Each thread is incrementing its own counter. But because that array is all continuous, and it's all in the same cache line, as soon as thread 1 updates its counter, it invalidates the cache line for the other threads. Even though they're not sharing the same data, there needs to be no synchronization going on, it invalidates it. And so each time a thread updates its counter, it invalidates it for all the other threads, which therefore causes a delay and latency when the data has to go back, get refreshed across the, the threads. It's really, really hard to um, find. What we have found, especially when you allocate arrays based on number of threads, is to make sure that any structures you're using that are allocated this way are padded out to at least a cache line so that the two ending portions of the structure don't overlap and cause fault, fault sharing. From there, this, is, this presentation has really just been pretty much an overview of a lot of the details that you can get in to see how memory can affect your performance. You know, Memory has not kept up with the increases in CPU performance, so they've put in these new constructs of cache, memory caches, NUMA, everything trying to make it so that if an application, if a system is set up correctly, it can actually run and perform a lot faster. You've seen that there's multiple different architectures across the different hosts, but they really, even though they have different names, they really have the same concept, and the same principles apply across all the multiple hosts. And if you ignore these, if you ignore the design considerations of the cache or the design considerations of NUMA, then you're going to have and run into performance problems. So make sure your system admins and your developers are up to speed on it. We will now take questions if there are any. and. We'll be glad to do our best at answering them. And again, I'm Claire Cates. I'm with SAS Institute. And we've got John Baker with MBS Solutions. And I know I will be glad to take uh, any questions you want to take, send an email, if, even if it's later in the day or next week. And I'm sure John will, too. Absolutely. Where did they go? I seem to have lost. What have you lost, John? I seem to have lost. Did you lose it? Did you get evicted from the memory? I got, got evicted, Claire. My goodness. Dashboard attendees. Well, let's go on to the next slide. Apparently, I don't know how to bring up the uh, the question panel that I saw earlier. Ah, there okay. it is. Hang on. Yes, I do. My apologies. One thing okay. I want to say quickly is CMG does have a conference in November. It's called IMPACT. It's at the Hyatt Regency in La Jolla. Uh, you can find out more information about the conference at www.cmg.net. And you can sign up for it. You can submit papers. You can submit presentations. Um, and you can also volunteer. We always take volunteers. But of course, you can register. Yeah, I should, uh, I should add on to that one as well, uh, that I'm actually running the, the System Z track. We actually have a dedicated uh, mainframe track at CMG this year. So yes, absolutely uh, get involved. If you've got a paper or an idea or a user story, we'd love to hear from you. But the questions, I did find them. Uh, by what mechanism is memory cache managed? Uh, Follow-up has work being done to optimize the algorithms that manage uh, memory cache. I think we've kind of touched on this at a high level, but is there anything you want to add, uh, Claire? 
I don't see the questions. I was supposed to be able to see them. So I'm say that so question honest. again. <laughs> By what mechanism is memory cache managed? And the follow-up question, has work been done to optimize the algorithms that manage memory cache? Yes, I mean, there's a lot. The pap one of the papers I described gets into more of the details of what you can do to uh, optimize, uh, especially in the algorithms, things that you can do with the memory cache. It really gets into uh, much more layout of the structures, how to uh, do this over that when you're accessing this type of data, um, how to break up structures so that you can, you know, it, it really gets into much, much more detail. Um, and that can be found within CMG, that paper. Great. Thanks, Claire. Uh, I do have another one. I think you also touched on this at the end, but the question is, what can an application programmer do about improving the cache performance of his or her program? Make sure that it is. Well, like in NUMA, uh, NUMA is one that we've had a lot of, you know, it's, it's been real interesting is because I really learned that, you know, learn putting the, the memory just on a local node may not be the most, the best thing. I mean, if it's thread local memory, and just only one thread is using the memory, yeah, put it on the local node. You don't want to have to go through an interconnect. But when you've got big multi-threaded applications that are using common memory, uh, it really makes a difference to what you can do with interleave, which will the OS will actually put uh, each page on a different uh, node. And so there's a lot of different techniques. There's a lot of good information out on the web. Of course, you have to pull through it. But I do think that the papers I wrote have uh, more detail in it because I come from the application background, so I've got much more um, information on the application. But if you have specific questions, feel free to email me again at claire.cates at sas.com, and I'll be glad to point you to resources or answer questions if you got it. Cool. Thanks, Claire. Uh, here's a good one. What tools are available to help people report on current cache performance and then tune it? I can tell you on the Z side, uh, again, we, we kind of hammered this a little bit, but the, the type 113 SMF record is cut by the CPU measurement facility. And if you do not have this turned on, man, you do not want to be uh, invoking the wrath of uh, the Kathy, Kathy Walsh of the world. Because if you call her for help, the Washington System Center, she will ask for your 113s. If you say you're not collecting them, she'll probably say, I can't help you. Um, so that's the short answer from the Z side, in uh, addition to, of course, your regular Type 70 record that yeah, gives you some info. Um, do you want to talk a bit about um, tools, Claire? Sure. My two favorite, and they're both on Windows and uh, Linux, are there's one that we got in-house called ThreadSpotter. It was by Rogue Wave. And about three years ago, I got an email message that they were not going to no longer support it, and I was just freaking out. Well, it turns out they gave it into, so now it's uh, freeware out there. So go Google Thre uh, Thread Spotter. It does a wonderful job um, telling you cache issues. And the one thing that I really love about this tool is that it will find fault sharing. And it will actually tell you fault sharing. You know, and it points to the source code location, so where you know, the fault sharing is actually occurring. It'll bring the source up. It gives, it has wonderful help and gives detailed information on why it's a problem. You know, it might tell you, tell you you've got a temporal problem where the memory is not staying in the cache long enough. But it will show you where, you know, it's getting evicted out. It will show you the, you know, where you're accessing it again that will try to bring it in. But another one I really like is Intel Inspector, I mean Intel uh, Amplifier. When you actually use it in the general expiration mode, it gets into the process counters. And this one again runs on both Windows and Linux. So basically on Intel chips. And um, it gets it can give you detailed data all the way down to the assembler level. And um, it it is very, very good. And I've gotten some really good NUMA data out of it. So those are the two I use the most. Uh, I know that there's other out there, but those are the two that I use the most. Awesome. OK, well, uh, there are more, but I realize we uh, have gone over. And I apologize for that, but uh, thank you everyone for attending. Absolutely, if you've uh, sent questions, we will get them. Uh, we will email you, uh, or if our, our uh, information's on the screen here, if by chance we didn't get your question, please uh, feel free to email, and we'll be happy to get back to you. And we hope to see you in La Jolla as well uh, at CMG International. 
And with that, um, I thank you and have a good day.